Good day, everyone. So good to see you, okay? And uh, this is Love Week, and so we celebrate in a number of ways. Uh, one of the things that I'm encourage all of you men, for sure, uh, women also, this applies to you, is uh, I know for me, I've got my list of uh, important women in my life. Uh, that I have prepared for this week. I'm gonna make sure that they know that they're special, that I'm thinking of them. I hope that you do the same thing too, okay? Uh, but let's go beyond that also as a church family. And instead of just our few that we kind of wrap our arms around that we know best, let's wrap our arms around the community and let's show them the love of Jesus Christ this week, right? Yes. And we do that through Love Week and we have laid it out there for, to make it as simple and as uh, as a applicable as possible for you. And I hope that you don't just take you along, but also you take your family and maybe even your work and uh, fellow you know, co-workers along with you and let's make a difference in the community. I know, here's what you do right now, sign up and then show up. I've already signed up for two of them and I'm gonna show up for two of them this week and let's love our community and make a difference, okay? Let's do it at Deer Creek, let's do it in Guthrie, Freedom House, Oklahoma City. Uh, let's do it together and make a huge impact. This is week number one of a new series that we have entitled, okay, Silent God. And we're going to go and look at the book of Habakkuk. If you turn with me to chapter number one, we will start with verse number one. And we are going to just go through each chapter of this book over the coming several weeks. All right. Now, before we dive into chapter one, starting with verse number one, get your Bibles, get your notes, Get ready, okay, uh, to listen to God's word. Would you just simply hold your hands out and let's pray together. At every location, just hold your hands out. You can hold your Bible out with that, whatever it is. And I just want you to repeat this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, give me the ears to hear what you want to say. Give me the faith to believe what you say. And give me the courage to obey what you say. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Let's look at verse number one. It's a great, great book of the Bible. It says, this is the message that the prophet Habakkuk received in a vision. Stop there for just a moment. Who is this guy? We don't know a lot about him. The Bible does not give us a lot about who he is. Uh, matter of fact, history does not give us a lot about this guy. We do know that it states clearly there that he is a prophet. Okay, so to establish first off, we can establish, you know, what does a prophet look like? Who is a prophet? What does a prophet do? Okay, uh, now I got to give you a mental image of what the way I see the Old Testament prophets versus priests. Okay, because to me they were vastly different. Uh, it, at least in their perception, at least in their image. Uh, the priests were the rule followers. The prophets all the times broke the boxes and stepped out, all right? So let me just give you kind of a, a modern day image of what that may look like. So the priest, if he were to walk in the room, stand on this platform, he would be in khakis with penny loafers, a white button-down shirt with button-down collar tucked in neatly with a nice belt on and with a solid tie that was just laid perfectly with a tie clip on there. And he would have drove to church today in his Prius. <laughs> the prophet is a different looking dude, okay? The prophet would have showed up at church wearing his black leather pants with his red wing boots with his t-shirt on that was rolled up sleeves and all tatted up. And he pulled up riding on his Harley. That's the prophet. Okay, do you get that middle image? Okay, the prophet was coming in town and he was blaring out these words from God. You know, that, that, that's who he was. Matter of fact, there was 12 minor prophets in the Old Testament and Habakkuk is one of those. And most of them, when they showed up on the scene, they were roaring out, turn or burn. They were saying, get right with God. They were saying, judgment is coming and you need to just begin to line up with God. And, and so that was kind of the message that they brought. But not this guy. No, he's yelling, he's screaming, but not at the children of Israel. He's yelling and screaming at God. Matter of fact, what we get here is we get to dive into one man's personal spiritual struggle and journal that he had. 
Matter of fact, he argues with God. And that's the significance of the story, and we're going to die into it, dive into it because I think by the time you know, we get into this, you will be able to relate with this man and who he is. Look at verse number two. It says, he cries out, How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Do you hear his distress? Do you feel his emotion as he's talking to God? Just a very quick background on what, the, what is going on. The Assyrians have basically ransacked. They've pillaged. They've raped the nation of Israel. They're a law unto themselves. And he is wrestling with this. What is going on? Now, let me put it in modern day terminology. It would be like ISIS. You see, you hear reports of them coming in and taking over America. And now Sharia law is the order. And, and you're just like, what's going on? And this is the type of scenario that he is dealing with. And he's crying out to God. Violence is everywhere. And where are you, God? Now, back to verse number one. There is a, it says that this is the message. Now, that word message is so crucial. Because that word message, going back to the Hebrew, means masal, or an utterance, a burden, a word from God. There's going to be those moments which you're going to feel like violence is everywhere, and your God, do you have questions, and God will give you a word from him. There may be periods that you feel like he's silent, that you've prayed, and it feels like, you know, my prayers aren't going anywhere. And I have people come to me, Pastor, I need a word from God. Almost like they want me to give them a word from God, which can happen sometimes. God can give me a word for them. Uh, but I know this, that God's word is readily available for you every single day through his word. And God's word is available to you every single day through his spirit. Come on, you got the Logos Word of God, the written Word of God. you got the Rhema Word of God, the Spirit of God speaking to you. And both of those go hand in hand. And I found out the more I get into the Word of God, the more I have the Rhema Spirit Word of God in my life. And the more I'm in tune to be able to hear His Word. And then also gives, God gives the people of God to speak to us. And so God can speak through people. I have found that the diversity of a church, the more so, the greater it is because it is amazing to me how I have had babes in Christ and I have those who have been serving Christ for years give me something. They're like, wow, that turns on a spiritual life. It's a word from God, a message. So here we are. He is struggling deeply. And he feels like God is silent. Why don't you write this down? God is often silent when we need him to speak the most. God is often silent when we most need him to speak. Why is that? I don't know all the answers to that. But I know this, that sometimes when God is silent, some people turn away and walk away from him. But then there's others that when God is not speaking, they seem to sink their spiritual roots deeper in God and be more grounded and grow stronger. Because I've learned this when God is not speaking, just keep doing the last thing he said. And when you keep doing the last thing he said, he will eventually speak again. And he's wanting to see, will you obey the last thing I said? I find this oftentimes I counsel somebody. They come to me like, you know, so I give them like a plan of action and then I say, how did it go last week? And they're like, oh, it's too busy. I can't get into the Bible. I didn't, I, huh, what? So let's go back and revisit that. Do that again this week. We're not moving forward to you. God does that sometimes to us. God wants you to simply keep doing the last thing that he spoke to you. So when violence is everywhere, what do we know? Let's, well, here's what we learned from Habakkuk. First off is this. Write this in your notes. What we see is sin. When violence is everywhere, what we see is sin. We see evil everywhere. 1870 to, two, to 1910, that time frame, 1870 to 1910, was a time frame which the world just moved forward, especially the Western world. 
Europe, uh, America. There was a lot of inventions uh, that began to make the lives of people better. Electricity uh, began to be more rapidly available to people. Um, indoor plumbing began to happen during those time frames. Um, slavery had been abolished. Uh, there was still years of progress that needed to happen vastly, but there, at least there were some strides forward. Uh, there was things like that happening. Lives of people were getting better around the world. And you know what happens? When man begins to improve themselves, man begins to let it go to their head. Matter of fact, there was peace on earth, and everybody's like, yes, everything's great. And then the 1910s coming. Does anybody know what happened in the 1910s? World War I. And there was more carnage, more death in that world war than any, time, any decade on the history of mankind. It was just, it was horrid what happened. And then you come out of the 1910s and you go into the 1920s. And does anybody by world history remember what happened there in that time? In America, there was the great what? Depression. Stock market plummeting. Millionaires overnight in poverty and owing huge amounts of debt and committing suicide. Famine began to sweep across America and drought. And, and it wasn't just an American thing. If you go back and look, it was a world issue of famine and poverty and disease, plagues, pestilence that began to sweep across the world. And then you go into the 1930s. And anybody know what the 1930s brought? It brought dictators. It brought world leaders. It brought crazy men that began to Genocide was rampant as during that time frame all the way through the early 1940s, there was just the Jews alone, over 6 million Jews were annihilated and there was many others that were killed. And then you got the 1940s, which actually was the late 1930s, but the 1940s, we got involved, America got involved, which was what? World War II. Now you think about this, at the very end of World War II, the mid-1940s, then the atomic bomb and nuclear war began. And you like realize, okay, man can actually just destroy this planet overnight. Can, can you feel the violence that's going on? Can you see that time frame? But in the middle of all of that was some of the greatest revivals and movements in Christendom that happened in America and around the globe that is still impacting the world today. When God was silent, God was still working. Here, this man is struggling. Look at verse number three. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Must I watch all this mystery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has become perverted. You know what he's doing here? He's seeing evil everywhere and he sees that God is not doing anything. And this is a hard pill for Habakkuk to swallow. And you can relate. The circumstances may be different, but every single one of us has Violence that's going on in life. We have struggle that's going on. And you know what? We question God. It, it, it may be like this. That you see the 92-year-old chain smoker all of his life. Who's living a long, happy life. Seems like everything is going fine. But yet you've got that friend who is 42 years of age and dying of lung cancer and has never picked up a cigarette in their life. And all they've done is follow Jesus Christ. And it makes you ask questions. Or maybe, maybe it's that you've got the children that you raised in church. You've given them the word of God. I mean, they've had it planted in them. You know the word of God will not return void. Then you're like, you're seeing them not follow Christ in the early adult years. And you're asking God, God, what is going on? I have obeyed your word. I've done the best of my ability to. And you're saying, God, I've got questions. I'm struggling with you in this. Or I'm a hard worker and I've been faithful. And I've been loyal to the company and I've been faithful in church and doing my best to be a light in darkness and yet I'm bypassed again and again while it seems like others that do not deserve it are getting the promotions. Or, or, or maybe it's that you feel like 
Your friends and other people are getting the new car and they're getting the new home and they're advancing and yet you're struggling and you're paying your tithe and you're trying to make ends meet and you've got questions for God. Or maybe you're struggling with some deep struggle, some addiction inside of you and you've prayed and prayed and asked God to remove that and yet you keep struggling deeply and you feel like others seem to be immediately set free. How many have ever had those questions? How many struggle like that? I do. And in those moments, you may feel like Habakkuk. You may feel like, number one, God doesn't care. God doesn't care about me, doesn't care about my situation, because that's what the enemy will plant in your head. And the second thing that you begin to feel like Habakkuk is that, God, you can do something, and you won't. God, you can heal, and it doesn't seem like you won't. I prayed. God, God, you can turn around my circumstances, and what is going on? It's not turning around. And you know that God has all power, all ability, but yet nothing is seemingly happening, which brings me to the second thought in this message. When violence is everywhere, what you hear may be shocking from God. Okay, you see all the violence, but then what you hear may be shocking from God. Because this is important to note, what God does or doesn't do doesn't always seem fair. Look at verse number five. God speaks. And the Lord replied, look around at the nations and look and be amazed. For I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if somebody told you about it. Now what is going on here? What he is saying when he says, you won't believe even if I told you, is this. You will not understand even if I told you what was going on. I've had people tell me before, I just don't understand God. And? That's kind of the point. He's God. His ways are higher than yours. Or, or, or it's this. God just, God just doesn't make sense. Let me say this. To say God doesn't make sense makes no sense. Because God have made sense, you know, is that, you, you get me? He ain't God. And so we struggle. But for Habakkuk, this is very personal. Look at verse number six. God says, I'm raising up the Babylonians. Who are the Babylonians? A cruel and violent people. They will march across the world and conquer other lands. They are notorious for their cruelty and they do whatever they like. On they come, all bent on, say it with me. Today's message is the violence that we feel and how we should respond to that. You know, in Habakkuk, what he's feeling is God is adding fuel on the fire. Who are the Babylonians? Okay, you get the Assyrians who have done the damage in Israel and then here comes the Babylonians. It would be like this, okay? Isis is running the land and now on top of that, here comes the North Koreans. Do you feel that? Do you sense it's going from evil to evil? From violence to violence. About nine months ago, I went in and had shoulder surgery. This was not your typical shoulder surgery. I had, had, had a, 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 an accident where I broke my arm uh, through my bicep. We found out later. Uh, and then also broke up the top of my humerus at the top of my shoulder here. Uh, I had uh, my, a 360 degree labrum tear. I had to have a number of anchors put in. Uh, in fact, a couple of orthopedic surgeons, friends of mine that I showed them the MRI to it before the surgery said, I would not touch it. You, you probably need a shoulder replacement. Uh, one of my friends that I'd known for a long time that attends church here did uh, the surgery uh, on that shoulder. And then also when I had that MRI done, I had an MRI done on my knee, which I'd had years of issues with that. That dates back, you know, the last surgery I had was over 20 years ago. And at that time, the doctor who did it said, you know, you got fourth degree chondromalacia, which is arthritis, and it is shot. It is no good. You just need a total knee replaced back then, years ago. And so when I had my knee also MRI'd, the doctor of radiology comes out, in which oftentimes you don't meet them. They just write the report up, send it on. You just meet the nurse or whoever's sending you through to get the MRI. But he comes out and shakes my hand, and he says, I just wanted to meet you. I said, wow, why did you want to meet me? He said, because that's the worst knee I've ever seen. He said, I've been doing this for over 20 years, and it's the worst one I've seen. I didn't know whether to say thank you, that's wonderful, or not, you know. 
He said, don't get me wrong, I've seen actually car wrecks where somebody's knee is just crushed and it, it's just, there's nothing to it that's been worse. But I've never seen anybody walk in or even in crutches that have come in here that have had that bad of a knee. And so when my doctor did it, and Shannon can vouch for this because I didn't hear it at the moment, came out. Basically, he said this. He said, that's the worst knee that I've ever done. So later on, I asked him about this. I said, what do you mean? Because people say that sometimes, but you're like, it's just kind of words that you say. And he said, well, Rodney, I've been doing, I do five to six every single week, sometimes more. Uh, but I've done thousands, thousands of these over the past 20 uh, plus years. And he said, I've never seen one that bad. Okay. So that's the situation my body is in. Then I have the surgeries, have a shoulder surgery first, then I have a total knee replacement, and then I come out, and the day we get home from the hospital, we have no running water in the house. And I got to deal with that. And on top of that, there's some personal things going on, and then there is some greater pictures inside our church family and individuals' lives where it's just and people's lives have been devastated and hurt. And you know what I begin to feel? God, you're adding fuel to the fire. God, it's violence on top of violence. Have you felt that in your own life? And you wonder, God, what are you doing? And that's what's going on here in this passage. And it reminds me of the story that we just got out of the last few weeks, the story of Joseph, the dreamer series. Don't you think he felt that way? Don't you think that whenever he has this word from God, dream from God, the coat of many colors, but yet there is divisiveness in the family. His brothers get to the point of jealousy and hatred that they strip him of the coat of many colors. They beat him up. They throw him into a pit. He felt the violence. And then when he cries out to God, it seems like God doesn't answer at all. Matter of fact, he's silent because he sells him off. They sell him off to some slave traders. They haul him off to Egypt. They sell him to slavery there. He starts at the bottom. Still, he begins to rise to the top. And then he's lied about, wrongly convicted, and he's thrown into prison again. Do you sense the struggle that he probably is feeling? And God, are you hearing me? God, did I really have a vision from you and a dream from you? God, is this really happening? And then he helps people out of prison, and he says, remember me, and they forget about him for another two years? Violence on top of violence. Struggle on top of struggle. Which brings me to the fact that our ability to comprehend God's ways is beyond our reach. Matter of fact, I remember when I was, my children was young, especially my middle child, Phaedra, was young. I remember handing her off to a nurse, somebody that she did not even know. And as I handed her off, she went from being happy, at peace, to all of a sudden screaming. Because she's like, who is this lady you're handing? And then the lady pulls out this long needle that she pulls out. And then my daughter is really looking at me with big eyes saying, Dad, what are you doing? And then this lady takes this needle and drives it into her shoulder. And she is looking at me with tears going down her face, screaming. She can't understand what Dad is doing to her or allowing to be done to her. But you know as well as I do that my level of understanding is greater than hers because the gap between me and her is much But let me say something about this. The gap between you and God is even greater. It's not even close. And your heavenly father knows what's best for you. And in Joseph's story, he knew what he was doing. He was planning out the saving of many lives. He was planning out even the lineage of Christ that would come down the line many thousands of years later. Woo, that is so good. You see, when we... When things seem like they are going the most wrong is when God is most present. And that's the way it was with Joseph. Everywhere he showed up, the Bible says God was where? Okay, now I'm going to go back and preach this message again, the series. Come on, somebody help me out in Guthrie or Deer Creek or somebody. God was where? God was with him. God was with him when he was in the pit. God was with him when he was in Potiphar's house. God was with him when he was lied about. God was with him when he was in the prison. God was with him when he was forgotten. And God was with him in the palace. Because when things seem to be going most wrong in your life, it's when God is most present. But God's timetable is rarely in sync with ours. But that doesn't change the fact that he knows what he is doing. Which brings me to the final thought. 
when violence is everywhere, what you must embrace is the struggle. The name Habakkuk means to embrace or to struggle. This is so key to note. It means to embrace or to struggle. And Habakkuk was very bold and very honest with God. And he gives us an example here of how we are to approach those moments when we wonder why God is not speaking. He is bold and he is honest. He goes after God. He asks God some very tough rhetorical questions. And you would think God would look at him because he's God and he knows everything and we know nothing, right? Because the gap is that big. It's infinitely large that God would look down at him and say, hey, dude, stay in your lane, bro. But God doesn't do that. You know what God does? God invites the struggle. God invites the questions. God invites us to engage with him. And in verse number 12, listen to what the prophet says. He says, oh Lord, my God, my holy one, you are eternal. Surely you do not plan to wipe us out. Oh Lord, our rock, you have sent these Babylonians to correct us, to punish us for our many sins. Notice what he's saying here. This is so important. He's saying, my holy one, did you get that? He's saying, I would give up, but I know that you're holy. I would give up, but I know that you're just. I would give up, but I know that you're in control. And where else can I turn but to you? I think of the story in the New Testament when the disciples, the the Bible says that many stopped following Jesus and Jesus turned to his closest followers and said, are you gonna leave me also? And what did they say? They said, where can we turn but to you? You know what Habakkuk has rooted inside of him? He said, even when violence is everywhere, where else can I turn but God? And what I want you as followers of Jesus Christ to get inside of you is that you're gonna have all hell break loose sometimes, but you've gotta get lodged in your mind. Where else can I turn but God? Can I turn to Facebook and the friends I have there for answers? Absolutely not. Can I turn to my job, my resources, my education? Absolutely not. You turn to the one who set the world into order, the one who holds the very breath that you breathe, and you say, God, you're the only place that I can turn to. You're my only hope. Look at verse number 13. He says, but you are pure and cannot stand the sight of evil. Will you wink at treachery? Should you be silent while the wicked swallow up people more righteous than they are? You see, Habakkuk struggles with doubt and questions about what God is going to do or not do. But walking away from God was never an answer for him. Hear me. It's like any marriage. The answer is not walking away. The answer is engaging and fighting not against each other, but for each other. And what he is doing is he's engaging the fight with God. Mm. You see... Habakkuk is having an unconditional, sincere struggle with God. And you can wrestle with God when you understand his grace. I want this to sink in because that's a safe place to be. You see, whenever I grew up, fortunately, I grew up with a dad who was, in my opinion, a healthy dad. Not a perfect dad, but a healthy dad. He loved us kids. He embraced us kids. And I remember early on, uh, oftentimes me being on his back, another brother being at his side and wrestling with him in the living room floor and just being thrown around and moved around, all the stuff. And we were no match for him. Sometimes he would let us get on top of him and we'd be like winning the battle. But the truth of the matter is we weren't winning anything against dad. Dad had the power over us. But there was never one moment that I felt fearful, threatened, I never felt that my life was in danger or that he was going to hurt me. You know what I always felt? My dad, with all of his power, his strength, that I actually enjoyed. I found strength and confidence in him. You see, that's what your heavenly father wants you to understand about him. He has all power. He has all strength. And he wants you to find the grace and realize that that grace is there 
that ever present help in time of need to come wrestle with him and struggle with him. And in the struggle is where you find your hope. Mm. In the book of Matthew, chapter number 11, there's a story. Jesus has asked some questions, and Jesus begins to tell who's the greatest. He's talking about John the Baptist, which is so amazing because he just says, the greatest born among men is who? John the Baptist. Or born among women is John the Baptist. Well, you go back up in that same, just verses before, John the Baptist sent word to Jesus to ask, are you really the Messiah? Or should we look for another one? You know what, John, in my opinion, I know there's different, different takes on that, but you know what I believe John was saying? John was saying, okay, if you are the Messiah, come get me out of this prison now because they're about to behead me. Come, come get me out of this prison now because this is not looking good. You know what the word Jesus sends back to him? Tell John the Baptist that the blind see, the deaf ear, the lame walk, and that the gospel, the good news is being preached everywhere I go. That's not what he's wanting to hear. And sometimes it's not what you want to hear because his word that comes back is shocking to you. John the Baptist ended up dying, but Jesus were to say this to his closest followers after that scenario, and that is the stage that is said, he said, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by what? The kingdom of heaven, you will see that slide coming up on the screen, just right there, boom. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it what? What does that mean to you and me today? It means in this world as followers of Jesus Christ, you're gonna have those times where God seems silent, where you are engaged in a battle and you're asking God what's going on, but how do you approach it? The kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. That means you come running to the throne room of God and you engage, you embrace the struggle with God and say, God, I can't change this, but I'm coming to the one who can. Oh, so good. You see, sometimes we, we, we feel like, you know, we can't question God. Have you ever, ever kind of had that preached, the don't question God? God knows what he's doing. God doesn't say don't question him. In fact, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was a lot of great people who questioned God. Or maybe the other side of it, you just blame God for everything and you question God in an accusation type way. No, no, that's not what you do either. It's not that you bring accusation against God, you bring your questions to God. Come on, we, start, we got too many questions being asked on Facebook. They need to be asked at the throne room of God. Let's go to the very last verse in chapter 1. These are the last two things that are given by the prophet. Two questions. It says, will you let them get away with this forever? Have you felt that way? Will you succeed? Will they succeed forever in their heartless quest? Do you feel his struggle? It ends right there. It, it's, it's over with that. No hope, seemingly, or all hope, because he's going to the right place. Do you see the difference? You see, this week I'm talking about violence. Next week I'm gonna talk about the vision. Then I'm gonna talk about the victory. And we're going to take it through a process of this, looking at the book of Habakkuk. But I made a statement earlier about the grace of God, that when you wrestle with God, you, you, you're understanding his grace and that it is a safe place. Because the grace of God gives us freedom, even boldness, to come to him and ask for anything. This is so important. And another thing the grace of God gives us, it gives us the ability to come to him and have confidence that whatever happens in my life, I'm going to come out victorious. How, how do I know that? That's when you embrace the struggle and engage grace. Is that you realize that Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 12 that I'm a child of God and I can come to the throne room of God. Okay, Habakkuk was coming to the throne of God without what Jesus had already done on the cross. And now Christ has done this on the cross. How much more should we as children of God come to him with the questions we have and our struggles and embrace that struggle, realizing that I'm a child of God. Blood what? 
redeemed of the Lord, and I have through the blood of Jesus Christ access to the throne of God, and I can come in there and say, God, I'm your child. I don't know why this is going on. I don't know why I've been overlooked. I don't know why the health is going this south in my life, and I don't know what's going on, but God, I'm your child, and I know that I can embrace the struggle, and I can wrestle with you, and that you hear and you answer my prayer. And that there, the throne room of God, his grace is sufficient for you. Oh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the apostle Paul has cried out to God. And he reminds God, I've been shipwrecked many times. I've been beaten many times. I've been cold and naked. I've been without food. I've had a thorn in my flesh that I've prayed many times for you to remove and there's no answer. It seems you're silent. And then Jesus shows up to him. Jesus shows up to him and says this. He says, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you in your time of need. Come on, church. That's the good news that we have. It ended with questions, but he knew down deep inside that if I just embraced the struggle, that's all I need to do because in my father's arms, everything was going to be okay. That's the good news. Father, we pray right now by your power and your spirit. Eyes closed, no one looking around. There's people that need to embrace the struggle. You've got questions for God. Embrace the struggle. No one looking around. There's some that are listening to me right now that you're far from God. Let's just say no matter how good you are or think you are, if you're not forgiven of your sins and ask Christ to come into your life and make you a new create, you're far from God. Because all of your righteous deeds are like filthy rags in the sight of God. And what do you do when you're far from God? The Bible says to repent. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and ask him to come into your heart and make you a new creation. And the second thing you're to do is to be baptized in water. That's a, that's a scriptural direction that's been given to us is to ask for forgiveness of sins. When the Holy Spirit calls your name to repent and then to follow up in water baptism. Make that decision right now. Make the decision to mark your communication card that I wanna be baptized. Put your name, your information, we will follow that up. But right now, pray that sinner's prayer. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. It's not just part of your life, it's all of your life. It's dying to yourself, letting Christ come alive. Secondly is this, across this room, there's people that are embracing the struggle right now. The Holy Spirit has been working on you as this message was spoken. And you're right now realizing that I've got to embrace the struggle like never before. I'm going to embrace it and come to the throne room of God. You've got those questions. You've got those struggles. You're, you're battling right now. You don't have the answers. You're saying, God, why are you silent? Why, why am I not hearing you? What's going on? Or maybe you've heard, but what the answer you've got is shocking to you. God's speaking to you right now. I want you to begin to stand to your feet at every location. Stand to your feet right now. Stand. Stand. God's speaking to you right now. Stand. Stand in Guthrie. Stand in Deer Creek. What you heard has been shocking. Or maybe you're not hearing anything at all. You're crying out to him. Maybe you need to engage, engage the struggle and wrestle with God. Stand. Stand. I want to pray for you. Father God, at every location, there's people standing right now. I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that they don't run from and they don't take the questions to anyone else but you, but they run into your throne room and they engage you with the questions they have. And they say, God, where else can I turn but to you? And they wrestle with you. In Jesus' name, amen.